I was 14. Um, I was playing Sunday league football. I was doing pretty well playing left wing, scoring a lot of goals. I think I scored about 30 my first year from left wing. Um, that's when the, the Clinchers of Brentford came around and started looking at players. I got asked for a trial and then I went for the trial. I got in, I signed schoolboy forms. In fact, I still got the, um, I still got the, one sec. <laughs> this, this won't spoil it. Hopefully this will advance it. Sure. I went to my mum's a few weeks ago and she, she dug up my school reports. We're not going to get into that. But the day I signed for Brentford was on here. Okay, so well. 28th. 28th of October 1984. So I was 14, I was a schoolboy. That was my first association with, with professional football and number 20. So, yeah, she still got that. Still in the same envelope. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, mums don't throw anything away. But, um, yeah, that was my association with the club. I, I um, left school at 16 to into the roller coaster of, of the world of professional football, training with the pros every day, up against them most days, um, loving that challenge. It was the school of hard knocks back then, verbally and, and physically. But I, I overcame that, um, had a few trial, not trial, but loan periods um, at 18, just to see if I could play against men. And I ticked the boxes of that. The second loan, I went out and lived in Finland for six months and came back as uh, the, the top scorer in my team out there. And I came straight back into the first team and I had three, three and a bit seasons in the first team before I got a move to, to Wimbledon in the Premier League. The VAR Show. The one place for your weekly football update. So hello, a very warm welcome to the VAR show, the show which talks about all the major football leagues. Detail. Today we are going to conduct a team of interviews and we have Mr. Marcus Gale who has played for the likes of Brentford, Wimbledon, Rangers among a host of other teams. So without wasting much time, I would like to first thank Marcus for coming on the show. Thank you and welcome to the show. And I would like to begin by asking you, how are you and what are you doing these days? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your, on your show. Um, yeah, keeping myself healthy, uh, trying to keep fit. I do a bit of yoga most days, um, eat the right kinds of food and just keep myself physically and mentally sharp as possible. So that's that's my day-to-day -day routine um, amongst little bits and pieces of work that I still do. Definitely. And so like you mentioned yoga, did you like incorporate that after you finished playing or did you, did you have it during your playing days also? Um, I, I came into yoga about five years ago. Um, yeah. I wish I did it while, while I was playing. I would have found the benefits um, of practicing yoga. Um, not to say I would have played better, but I would have gone into the matches um, a bit fresher, maybe 10% fresher, 20% fresher. Because we used to play a lot of games back to back, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. So I think if I incorporated yoga back then, I would have gone into those midweek games um, a bit faster than I did. Definitely. And uh, I'll ask you a very, very basic question. Why football? Um, that's what I was here to do from very little. My mum tells a story when we was at uh, my granddad's house. We all lived in one house at one time. And my granddad was changing a light bulb in, in the 70s. It was like a, it, it looked like a football. It was a lampshade. He put that down to change the bulb. And all they could see was this little two-year-old backpedaling and then running up and smashing this light bulb thing. Um, and that's, that's when they decided this kid needs a football. So that's what I was given. And I've been kicking it ever since. If you, and you like back then, do you have any reference point like whom you probably wanted to emulate or someone? Um, other sports. I was I was doing Kung Fu when I got 10. I was into it to athletics. So I was doing quite a lot of sports by the age of 10, 11. Um, I had three belts in Kung Fu um, by the age of 12. But it came to a time where my week was so congested with sport 
Um, I know I was always geared to do football, so I, I kind of gave up Kung Fu, stopped the athletics, but I took the, the mental and the sort of the practices into my football as well, from Kung Fu and athletics. So I didn't quite give up on those sports. I just incorporated them in different areas in, into my football achievements. Definitely. And, you know, like, it's been a while since you last played, you know, like, competitively, at least in terms of clubs. What is the biggest thing that you miss about playing? I think the day-to-day, -day, um, in the changing room, the sort of camaraderie, the banter, the jokes. Um, I'm still quite playful now. So when I get around it, I just jump back into that sort of mindset when I was 25 years younger or so. Um, but I actually miss the... the the roar of the crowd when you walk out onto the pitch to take your, your place out there. I, I, yeah, I would say I would, I would miss that. Um, but luckily, I'm still connected within football at Brentford. So I still get to, to be a part of that sort of match day experience as um, a club ambassador for them. So um, not all is lost. Definitely. And you know, like you have like uh, performed extremely well for Brentford during your playing days. And uh, what is the like? How did Brentford happen in the first place for you? Um, Brentford happened for me. I was 14. Um, I was playing Sunday League football. I was doing pretty well, playing left wing, scoring a lot of goals. I think I scored about 30 my first year from left wing. Um, that's when the attentions of Brentford came around and started looking at players. I got asked for a trial and then I went for the trial. I got in, I signed schoolboy forms. In fact, I still got the... Um, I still got the one sec. <laughs> this this won't spoil it. Hopefully, this will advance it. Sure. I went to my mum's a few weeks ago, and she she dug up my school reports. We're not going to get into that. But the day I signed for Brentford was on here. Okay. So well, twenty eighth, twenty eighth of October, nineteen eighty four. So I was fourteen. I was a schoolboy. That was my first association with. with Professional football and, and with Brentford. So, yeah, she still got that still in the same envelope. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, mums don't throw anything away. But, um, yeah, that was my association with the club. I, I um, left school at 16 to into the roller coaster of, of the world of professional football, training with the pros every day, up against them most days. Um, loving that challenge. It was the school of hard knocks back then, verbally and, and physically. But I, I overcame that. Um, had a few trial, not trial, but loan periods um, at 18, just to see if I could play against men. And I ticked the boxes of that. The second loan, I went out and lived in Finland for six months and came back as uh, the, the top scorer in my team out there. And I came straight back into the first team and I had three, three and a bit seasons in the first team before I got a move to, to Wimbledon in the Premier League. Definitely. And you know, do you see like you said like how you went out on loan and especially like your major break came after you came back from Finland. Was it very important for you to take that step when you yeah. look back now? Yeah, initially at 19, I didn't want to go. I just thought my mum wanted me at the house. I, my manager just wanted a shot of me, didn't want, want me around. So I just said, no, I don't want to go. But when I spoke to my mum, my mum said, this could be the making of you. Um, so I went in and told the manager exactly what she said the following day. And he he uh, responded by saying, you was going out there anyway. <laughs> um, I just forgot to tell you for the last two weeks, the team's been expecting you. And, and I confirmed that sort of story from the manager because when I did go out to Finland, they said, where you been? We've been waiting for you for two weeks. Everyone's been waiting for you. Where you been? I said, I didn't know until last week. I just got here. Um, but I hit the ground running, fortunately. And... Um, that loan period just gave me the confidence to say, yeah, I think I can really perform as a professional footballer. Um, I had a good taste of, of international football out there in Finland. Um, played uh, European football as well, for two matches against Dinamo Kiev. So my confidence when I came back was sky high. And um, I was put straight back into um, that Brentford first team and didn't look back. But I think it took those two loan periods for me to really get a sense of who I am and, and get my confidence up. And you're like, I want to ask like, like if even till date you see like, you know, like maybe like the top tier teams loaning out players, younger players to gain experience. What, how does that change a player? Because you know, like you say, you have to go and play against men. 
and but probably like so if i'll just just for a uh, lack of a better example i'll say liverpool they sent out some player to maybe a lower league side wouldn't he be better served in like playing with their players back at liverpool than going out on loan what does that change um players develop at different stages um there's a strategy behind the loans as well i know some clubs will send their players out to a team that wins all the time to, to have that pressure of always winning and have to win and some of them will send them to a team that's struggling but they know the opposite end of of, of winning where you're losing and it toughens your character and your mentality that way um so there's a strategy behind it i think in my case it was just um can he just break out of his little bubble that he's in he's probably too comfortable can he put can we push him on by putting him out on loan um and it certainly did that um and I, I didn't look back but I, I encourage players to to get out of that comfort zone and um and, and try their luck doesn't matter if it's a league below but you're getting gained and um, for the, the top flight players in our contracts in a multi-million pound squad that they're not going to get into on a regular basis but it's a case of where can you get your game time because you're, you're only young for once and you can never go back in time and, and be 19 again and wonder where where your games went because you didn't you didn't go out on loan so i would definitely encourage players to, to get out on loan and get their games in. definitely so you know like you have played for various teams in like all across europe and I, i'll not put in a spot but other than brentford because you are associated with them now if you had to choose one place where you enjoyed your time the most which one would that be uh wimbledon was quite quite um rolling it was always lively uh there was no time to sit on your laurels whether you was injured or not you had to keep an eye out because the whole environment there was always something naughty going on so you couldn't rest um i was there for 7 years um uh, And as an example my birthday obviously happens every year like everybody else but there was always like a tradition that something gets done to you on your birthday whether your car tires get let down or your clothes get cut up or even set on fire um I played the storyline for 7 years that my birthday was always on a day off because no one could touch you anyway <laughs> so um I survived just being a little bit cuter but at the same time I knew when everybody's birthdays was so um Yeah, I made sure I I I administered some some antics. But, um that club was a lot of fun, but also we were the serious serious contenders in that league as well in terms of our playing ability. We could beat anybody on on the day and and a lot of the time we beat them probably mentally first before the physical stuff came into it. We had good players in that side. And um I think sometimes we get the rub the, the wrong rub of the green in terms of the stereotype um of teams that we had you know the the original Wimbledon was a, a direct team from back to front um when they first got into the Premier League or the first division but the team I played in in the 90s we had I would say we had better te- technical footballers um and we could move the ball around the pitch quite easy as well so don't like the stereotype that we were just one dimensional I remember going to um Goodison Park beat them 3-1 and I remember the Goodison Park crowd stay behind and they applauded our Wimbledon team off the pitch not just cuz we beat them but in the manner of how we beat them we beat them playing their own game which was football we played them off the park that day and the crowd reacted to it their crowd if any you like you said like how you were at uh, Wimbledon for quite a while like around 7 years and also you were at Brentford before that how difficult is it like for you you or as a player in general to move from a club where they have spent so much time um I think my time at Brentford had come it run its course I was probably just stagnating at that that stage when I got the move um and it came out of the blue um it was one week I was playing I got substituted against Port Vale away and I just thought that's it so I can't perform here and I'm just going to be a, a, a league one player And, and just carve a career out like that and just be happy with that and then the following week so much stuff happened I, I, the, the transfer to Wimbledon came on the Thursday morning I think I trained on the Friday and I and I played you know the Saturday 24 hours later against Leeds United and, and I was on match of the day but it just shows you how far <laughs> a week can travel and, and you know jumping up from league 1 to the Premier League 
and, and, and holding my place in that, that team as well. There was only 10 matches of the season remaining of that Premier League season and I played every minute of those 10 matches and it was an unbelievable experience. We was on a high, we won seven matches, drew two and lost one against Everton. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that, that was the start of that sort of Premier League career for me. I think I ended up playing 204 games, which I'm very proud of in, in those six and a bit seasons. But well, it was a great place for my sort of education, um, not just on the, on the field, but off of it as well. You know, I felt that I grew up from being a boy to a man um, during those seven years at the club. If any, like you have played across, like you know, like the spectrum in terms of English football, like you played in League One, Championship, Premier League. Even like uh, you played in uh, Scottish League and even the Finland, like you mentioned, what is what does what is it about the Premier League that sets it apart? Maybe in terms of you know, like so much fanfare compared to other leagues, even like Scottish League, which is a different country altogether. And uh, like if you compare like Scottish top division and Premier League top division, what is it like which sets it apart? Um, it's just a bigger brand. It's so much focus. It's world renowned. Every player seems to want to come to the Premier League and play. Um, the money helps as well, but when when it first started, there wasn't that sort of huge money as it is today. Um, I would have loved to have played today, even for one season. I think the one season, if I played today, I would have earned <laughs> what I've done over like a 20-year career, because that's the difference of the game now. But I'm still pleased to have played, you know, around 700 matches and 100 goals in my career, but. The Premier League is just a, a different type of animal in terms of the money that it generates, um, the worldwide appeal. And as I said, the, you know, many of the world's best players, they end up coming here. But the only thing I would say about the Premier League is that we've never had the, um, the world's best player playing in the Premier League when he's the world's best player. We've had players that have come after. You know, we've had like players like Ruud Hullet. When Ruud Hullet was World Player of the Year, he played in Italy. But we've never had in the Premier League the current World Player of the Year, which um, I think that's going to be a challenge. But I'd like to see the world's best player play in the Premier League so we can all witness that person. Different. And you like, as a player, was there any difference like on the pitch, like in terms of playing in Premier League and the Championship? Um, the quality of pitches, the, the quality of players as well. Um, I think strikers. Um, between Championship and Premier League are, are slightly, not slightly, but there, there is a difference in, in that. You know, in the Championship, a striker might get two chances. You might take one, but a Premier League striker, if he gets the two, he'll probably take the two. It's just that fine margin of excellence in front of goal. Um, but today's game, I think the Championship is, is, a, is a good brand to watch as well. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a close cluster of teams currently in the championship that are performing really well. It's a very tight league this year, but you see, you're finding there's some good young English players in that in that division, um, and they can excel and, and promote themselves um, into the Premier League and, 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 and perform again. So the state of the game is quite good here. Definitely, and you know, like as a as a player, which was the most difficult opponent you played against? Uh, difficult, I will say, Martin Keown and Mar Marcel Desailly. Marcel at like Chelsea, when he first came, he was formidable. He's come off the back of a World Cup as well, so he had that aura about him as well. So he was like, yeah, I want to see how I fear against him. And, you know, Martin Keown was around for, for a generation and he was, he was quite awkward and difficult. He was quick, he was good in the air, he loved a tackle. He was awkward at times. Not, not to disrespect him, but very awkward to get past because he was a, a warrior type player. Um, and you had to be on top of your form to, to beat him and, and get the better of him. And you like, as a forward, what type of defenders you'd not like playing against? As a forward, oh. I enjoyed playing as a forward. That's the thing. I didn't, I didn't fear anybody. I didn't think, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have a good day against him. I, I, I relished every challenge. Um, Yap Stam was extremely good as well. I remember watching him the season that he came and he was taking the ball off centre back, uh, off the centre forwards and then going on these mazy runs down the left wing or the right wing and I was like, 
no, that cannot happen to me on national TV. And I made sure it didn't happen. I made sure I gave as good as I've got from him. And I'm proud to say he didn't run down that wing when, I, when he was up against me. So I take that as a, as, a, as a positive in my game. But I made him think more about defending than, not to say most forwards or attackers, but that was just my personal quest was to, to make him defend me and have that badge of honour. Definitely. And you know, like you started your career back in the late 1980s to early 90s. Yeah. And it has been a quite a while that you started your career. And how has the game evolved in your opinion? Um, the game's evolved in better quality of pitches, better understanding about training. Um, sports science has definitely helped with that. The players can recover better. There's better treatments now. The players are recovering a lot quicker. Uh, so the combination of all those things makes it a much better game to be involved with now. Uh, I remember playing on pitch. You don't really see Sandy Mouth, uh, Sandy Goldmouth anymore when you're watching Premier League or Championship matches because the pristine condition of the pitches now is there. so excellent. Um, I like to say my generation, we was probably more adaptable in terms of styles of pitches we played on, different sort of gradients of them, whether it was firm, soft, soggy, boggy, sandy. We we still had to perform. There was no excuse. A cross had to come in, a cross had to come in. We didn't care if there was a, a divot or a pothole or whatever it was. You still had to perform. And I think that's the difference of today's players is that they haven't, they haven't got that variant that variant in, in terms of uh, different styles of pitches. They're all pretty much perfect. So to me, there's no excuse. If you can't control the ball on a perfect pitch, then I don't know. But they've got a much better product in terms of what they what they train with and what they perform on, on a match day. Of course, and you're like also like the, that your generation of players and also maybe one generation above have always said that you know, like the players and the coaches complaining now about the fixture list is ridiculous. What is your opinion on it? You know what, there was fixture list pile-ups 25, 30, 40 years ago. People still have to get on with it. Um, we didn't have the luxury of flying around in private jets and all this stuff. Um, not like the modern day players, they can fly everywhere. So recovery for them. Yes, I know it's taking it out of you traveling, but. I'd rather take a private jet than a six hour bus back from Newcastle in the middle of the night to get home. Um, so they can complain, but that's the price of being successful. In terms of Liverpool, they've won the Premier League, they won the Champions League. So now they're afforded to even more pressure. Now that you're the king of the castle, you have to defend that um, with the best of, best of your team's ability. Um, but complaining about it doesn't help but because everyone's in the same position anyway. So. I think they just need to just get on with it and, and provide a good product. Definitely. And you're like, you are currently associated with Brentford and uh, Brentford have literally like, uh, they have turned around the, I, I think the vision that they had, maybe I think around last 10, 15 years, like about scouting and they, 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 they I think their transfers and scouting policy, I think can be the best, can be even considered the best in the country. Like it, it is that good, like compared to like what players they scout and get in. What, where do you think like that came from? Um, I think that vision's come from the, the owner, Matthew Benham. Um, he's an analytical individual, that's his company. Uh, and that's what he based a lot of the, the information on. So the recruitment reflects that as well. Um, every year we seem to be in tears about what players leave him because they're so great for us. At the same time, people are, are clued up now at Brentford is that, you know what? There is going to be someone else coming in and they're going to be the new darling of the crowd and we've got a new hero so let's just focus on that and that seems to have happened over the last seven years or so so um, it's, a, it's a great place to be at um, great people to be around and, and work around and, and obviously see the team evolve every year there's always like a a new player that's been on earth from from nowhere it seems to the, the vast majority of the public but to Brentford, we know the talent is, is in there um, with the recruitment. And it's about giving players the opportunity to, to perform in the team and hopefully get the team hopefully promoted into that Premier League, which we all want to be. But if not, and there's Premier League teams that come in for players, 
there's nothing really standing in the players' way. And as we've seen, you know, this calendar year where we sold uh, Saeed Ben Rama and Oli Watkins to the Premier League, um, and they're doing both pretty well. Particularly, Oli is, is a natural goal scorer. He's doing very well at that level. And Saeed is finding his way in at West Ham, but he's probably, I would say, the most talented individual I've seen at Brentford ever because of what he sort of possesses in skill. He's a, he's a street footballer that brings that rawness from the streets onto the professional pitch and, and still completes his tricks and productivity on the pitch. You know, we got, I think, it's 17 goals last year. Can't remember how many assists. So. Is a special player that we had at, at Brentford. And you know, like you mentioned, like how you uh, like getting promotion, of course, is the primary objective. And if it doesn't happen, like you tend to sell sell players to maybe whoever comes, like in the Premier League or other divisions. And do you think that that will f- will catch up someday? <laughs> because you know you can't just keep doing that. You know, like because it will catch up someday. Well, I think the the prices that we pay for players will steadily go up as we as we've experienced even at championship level but what we're getting back for players is still outweighing what we've paid for them I think there was a a stat going up about sold maybe about 10 players a combined total we bought them for about 10 million or whatever 12 million and they was all sold for about 110 so that that's the sort of formula that we have of player um, and we take chances on young players which is great so young players will be attracted to coming into a team like Brentford or a club like Brentford knowing that they're going to get in that first team and they're going to fulfil their, 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 their promise that they've been shoving Definitely and also like I'll get back to your career and you also got into management like post playing mm-hmm. was it something you always wanted to do or was it something like you missed the game so much that you wanted to keep in touch with the game um, I kind of stumbled into it. I didn't have any real ambition into getting into the management and stuff and coaching. Um, my sort of coaching career possibly started about my last year at Watford. That's when the seeds of it was planted because I was injured in my last year. Um, so I've spent a lot of time recovering, training, playing in the reserves at times, being around the younger players. And I found that the younger players... They was always tapping into my sort of knowledge. How do I do this? Can I stay out and do this with them? Do that with them? And show them little things. I, it was oblivious to me, but they saw a coach in me and I didn't see it at the time. And then um, obviously I left uh, Watford, went back to Brentford. And then my uncle started a Sunday team. And he just wanted me to come down once a month to help train the, the, the under 15s that he set up. And it turned out I was there every Friday and every Sunday with the team. And uh, the reaction from the, the, the parents was like, what are you telling them? They've never played like this before and this and that. And that gave me my confidence to go, go, you know, just get into coaching. And uh, I finally got that break at AFC Wimbledon with the development side for four years. Um, and I thought I'd done pretty well with, with the sort of players that was coming through. I was responsible in, in selecting most of them. Um, and then getting them to the point where getting to now, not at, at Wimbledon, but he's at Gillingham now, a kid called Ryan Jackson, who was a centre forward. And then I moved him, well, he moved himself to right wing because he knew he wasn't a centre forward. So he's trying to fool me, but I could see by his movement, he, he wasn't a, a natural forward, but he, on the right wing, he was devastating. And then had a problem at right back. And I said to Jack, can you just fill in there? And he rolled his eyes, he kissed his teeth. I mean, just get right back. And, um, Myself. And then I had the problem a couple of weeks later. I didn't have a right back. So, Jacko, I don't have a problem at right back. Do you think you could just fill in there? He goes, You know what, Kaylee? I think I like it there. So I said, All right, let's, let's work on that. And by the end of that season, he got into the first team at Wimbledon, done really well. I think he got about 10 or 11 matches and about three or four manager matches as well at right back. And, and that's the position he still plays to this very day. So, the coaching aspect, it delights me in terms of helping people um, achieve their dreams and then um, it came to an end at Wimbledon and I moved to Stainstown in non-league which is I think step six um, and again just took my philosophy with me give young players the opportunity to play 
and I've got still two players from that time of two and a half years at Staines that are still playing now. David Wheeler, who's at championship level with Wickham Wanderers, um, and a young player that's playing at my old club, Glasgow Rangers, um, Joe Rebo. So his one was interesting because he he played for me at 17 in my last year, and um, I got sacked at the end of 2014, just after Christmas. Um, but I said to him, I'm going to make a couple of phone calls for you. I can't promise much, but I'm going to make a couple of calls. One was to Charlton, uh, who picked up the, the phone and, and, and took him in. And I didn't hear anything for three months. I was getting a bit worried, but I got to say, yeah, they really like him and they want to sign him. So I was like, great, do what you need to do. Um, and then he just blossoms under the game, started scoring goals. Um, and then... 18 months ago, they sold him to, to Glasgow Rangers and, and now he's a Nigerian international. So I'm really pleased and proud of his sort of development because it was, um, it was a rare opportunity, opportunity to see such talent at a very young age and go on to play the levels that he's playing. Definitely. So, you know, like currently, are you involved in any capacity with coaching with any team, maybe even uh, non-league? No. No, the, my last sort of association with any sort of coaching was with a, a friend of mine that set up a, a camp called Full Time Football, which still goes on. So what we was doing back then was filling in the gaps of non-league training, where they traditionally train Tuesday night and Thursday night. So what we set up was we would uh, train Monday morning, Wednesday morning, just to fill those gaps. Charged them a little fee of, I think, it's about £30 for the week. And for that, they get a two-hour session with an ex-pro. We uh, provide a, a 4G pitch to train on. Um, we hold games against other academies. Um, we provide a, a training kit, so we look professional because that's our background. We just wanted things to look professional. Um, so I've done that for a couple of years with, with my good friend Ryan Fraser, who still runs it. Um, but through other work, I moved away from that. Um, started working with Kick It Out, um, and that's taken me up to this current point. Um, but that, that was my last sort of interaction with any sort of coaching was about three years ago. So, is it something that you want to get back into in future or something? Uh, no, I think that, that my time's come and gone with that. Um, I love the educational part of, of football. Um, every day I try and learn something new for myself. Um, and I find the work I do with Kick It Out gives me that as well. I learn a lot from the academy players, that system between nine and 23. Um, and it challenges me as well, which I like. But I think my, my focus is on education now, helping the next generations of, of footballers become better than the current ones. And that's not to disrespect the current ones, but can we start helping to create better players on and off the pitch with their sort of behaviour, their sort of conduct, their sort of level of, of knowledge. Um, and, and, and that's my sort of challenge. Definitely. And so we are coming to the end and I have last few set of questions. And which coach, if you had to pick one, had the biggest influence in your career? Oh, great question. Um, I would say Terry Burton at Wimbledon. He eventually came to Watford. And why I say Terry Burton is because I knew him from my Wimbledon days. He was a tech a tactician, he knew the game inside out. He, he, he took most of the training sessions, to be fair. And then um, when I moved to Wimbledon, I, I made a transition from being a centre forward to a centre back. And he was pivotal that as, as well as anything, you know, um, getting me to understand the sort of positions, the, even the basic training of like your footwork, how to, how to jockey a person and, and, and getting the right positions, when to go, when not to go, body shape and all this. So I learned quite a lot from Terry over a number of years, but particularly when I moved from centre four to centre back, he was he was vital in that, in terms of how I developed. Because I ended up being player of the year after my first season at centre back, so I was well delighted with that as well. Definitely, and you're like like were, like were you sceptical moving into like uh, centre back because you had spent uh, like so almost such amount of time playing for in the offensive part. No, I, I loved it. I felt like I was 16 again. I felt like a kid. That tool is like a brand new toy. And I'm just, yeah, I've got this every day now. Um, the, the, the 
the knowledge I had as a centre forward, I just brought it back with me. I knew what type of ball was coming from the opposite centre back or defenders. I knew when that ball came into the centre forward, I knew exactly how he wanted to receive it and where he wanted to take it if he could try and turn me around the corner. So I knew all of that. So I was like one step ahead. Uh, I don't think I got beat for pace, even though I lost pace moving from centre forward to centre back. But I think because of my knowledge, I was able to get to positions a fraction quicker than the centre forward. So it made out like I'm still very quick, even though I would say I lost half a yard, maybe a yard of pace. Um, I, I loved it playing at the back with Watford. Um, and I'm going back in there in about 10 days time when Brentford play, play Watford. So it'd be good to see a few old faces there. Definitely. And you're like... If you had to choose one, again, difficult question maybe, and if you had to choose one moment in your career as the proudest moment, which one would that be? Um, it's hard to say just one. Um, I think signing professional contracts at Brentford, that was that was huge because that was officially my dream. I, I'm now a professional, um, which I was always wanting to happen. Um, I think the other occasion was um, representing Jamaica making my debut and then playing in the World Cup of 1998. So, uh, yeah, those are the proud moments of my career. But there was, there was many moments in the career that I look back and say, yeah, I was proud of that. You know, I got promoted with Brentford in 1992. I was fairly young then. I was, what, 21 at the time. Um, so I enjoyed that experience, being one of the youngest ones in there, playing with a, a mature team, but held my own for the whole season. Um, but the experience of a of a professional career it's, it's a roller coaster. It's ups and downs. It's twists and turns, and throughout it all, you got to try and just stay level headed with it all. Don't get too high, don't get too low, but just try and stay level with everything that you're doing. Um, and I, I think that kept me safe within the game for all those years. Definitely. And you like if you had to choose three top three goals of your career, which one would that be? All right, let me think. My first goal against, uh, no, for Brentford, which was against Reading. Ball came to me about 35 yards out from back to goal. Ball came in, I rolled it down to my left and just hit it as hard as I could. That flew in. Uh, my, I think my third goal for Brentford, which was my first home goal, was against Bradford. Just had a man sent off um, and had to play a slightly different position. We had I think we had three guys in midfield and I was one of those three. Normally I'm wide left or up front, but they put me in the three-man midfield. And from that position, I picked the ball up just outside the centre circle, travelled about 20 yards and then hit this rocket shot that flew in. I think the shot's still flying, you know. It might be coming past your window anytime soon. Um, and then my third goal, I would say I scored against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge back in the good old days when you can drive to stadiums, park up. Um, there was a lot of intense comments in the press that week from Frank LeBeouf that enraged our camp. So we went full-blooded on him and Chelsea to win 4-2. And um, I would like to think I got the goal of the day, goal of the weekend, goal of Europe, I would like to think. We um, chested the ball down, back to goal again, turned, nutmeg Steve Clark, made my way to the edge of the box and then a lot of people think I, I, I hit the strike with the outside of my foot, but it was actually a toe punt because the tackle was coming. So I didn't have time to like take another step. So the nearest thing I could get to was I needed to just make contact. So I just stabbed my left big toe and the ball just arrowed <laughs> into the top corner. And I ran off like a crazy kid um, celebrating with my teammates. So those would be my one, two and three. And you like in the second one, you said like you were playing against 10 men. As an offensive player, is yeah. it easier to play against 10 men or is it easier to play um, against 11 men? Because when you have a man sent off, they will double up on the defence. Yeah, uh, I think at that stage, it didn't matter because we was, I think, 5-1 up. Okay. <laughs> so we was, we was back in that team. So to play against 10 men, their spirit had been broken. And we were just relaxed enough to just carry on playing and, and see if we can get any more goals, which luckily I did. I got I think, the last goal of the match. Um, and yeah, that was, that, yeah, I still remember that strike. It was just weird looking back at the footage of it. I was just trying to think what was going through my head. Why did I make that decision to... 
these are the things I can look back on now, seeing that I'm long retired. Um, I still play now when I can, um, do a lot of charity matches, particularly in the summer. So this year was disrupted with all of that through the lock-in period. There was no opportunities to really play matches like I know it, but I'll be back out there at my sprightly old age. Definitely. So we'll wrap it up with one final question. And in like, do you have any piece of advice for any young player who's just starting out? You've got to be selfish. I know selfish is banded as if it's a bad word, but I think you, selfish is a good word. I think you have to think of yourself and yourself you can in that in that training environment and in matches. Um, and it is difficult. You're plain sailing. If, if you, you speak up and you talk about it, um, I think the advent of social media now allows young players now to communicate in different ways. When I was 16 and I had no, no chance to have a phone, <laughs> there was no internet or anything like that. No, so you had to physically speak to someone. And at that time, I was as quiet as a cat. But um, I think now, today, you've got the opportunity now to use social media to, to express yourself, to use it. But if you've got good people around you, your family, trusted individuals that you can speak to, a trusted head coach or coach at the club um, that you can speak to, I think do that because you, it's all about you. You've got to be so good that you've got to fit into a team with another 10 people. And they're thinking the same as and so selfish is not a bad word in my book. I think it's a healthy word once you apply yourself in the right way. Definitely. And you like on that note, Marcus, thank you so much for talking to me. And I wish you all the best for all your endeavors, especially with Kick It Out Way, which is a very, very good thing. And I think it's too late, but it's better late than never. And yeah. also, I hope Brentford get promoted this year, you know, and as an ambassador. Yeah, I, I hope so too. Um, the team is a good team. We're, we think we're two points off number one spot um, got a very good striker or two um, at the moment so that, that's very healthy for, for the team and the club right now definitely and thank you so much and hope to talk to you again soon till then take care stay safe bye thank you very much take thank care. you bye player wise it would have to be Steven Gerrard just because again before before I became a, a journalist you know he was he was someone I just admired massively in terms of the absolute complete footballer. I think if you were trying to like make a footballer in a factory, he would it would be Steven Gerrard, someone who, you know, he, I think JD Carragher summed it up best once when he said, you know, Steven Gerrard's biggest strength is he doesn't have any weaknesses. Ah, the stadium. Uh, I, I don't see really uh, need to do that, mainly um, such a, a big spending. But it's true that it would be a, a fantastic stadium. That's not bad, but uh, you have to be careful. And mainly at this moment uh, when we are going to face a very difficult time.